السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Dear brothers and sisters, the fact that Hajj, the pilgrimage, has been given the title of Rukun, the pillar of Islam, one of the five, is at first quite baffling. Think about it. The Shahada, the statement of declaration of Tawheed, you say it many times a day. Uh, the other pillar of Islam, Salah, you're doing it five times minimally each day. Fasting, you're carrying out 30 or so days of fasting each year. It's reoccurring. You understand why it's a pillar of the religion. The same can be said about zakah, the annual charity that we give to the poor. It's a reoccurring thing. But when you look at Hajj, why is that a pillar of the religion? It's an act of worship that only requires three or so days in your lifetime. And then afterwards, you don't really necessarily need to think about doing it again as in terms of it being an obligation. Yet, it is still considered to be a pillar of the religion. Surely, therefore, there are life and afterlife changing properties within Hajj that are so powerful that those few days cannot be reproduced or replicated in any other experience in life. And in this video, I want to share with you some of those lessons in, in the hope of cementing your intention for a Hajj whenever the soonest opportunity for you arises and to reignite your enthusiasm for it. So that whenever you feel that that enthusiasm has taken a dip, you have a reference to go back to. I want to share with you three of what I believe are some of the most important lessons that come with Hajj that qualify it for this title of pillar, pillar of the religion. The first of those three lessons. Hajj is one of the most powerful reminders in existence with respect to the day of reckoning, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. There is a surah in the Qur'an called Surah Al-Hajj, the chapter of Hajj. And the very first ayah within it seems outwardly nothing to do with Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal nasu attaqwa rabbakum, inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim, O people, fear your Lord, because of the quaking of the hour will be a terrible thing. Then Allah goes on to say, That's the day when you will see every nursing mother forgetting her nursling. And every pregnant woman will drop her load. And you shall see mankind on that day in a drunken state but they will not be drunken it is the punishment of Allah Almighty that is severe so the fact that the very first verses ayat of Surah Al-Hajj do not actually address the Hajj itself but the day of reckoning instead that is an indication that there is a major link between the two the former is a powerful demonstration of the latter and I can say that just as the forgetfulness of the Day of Judgment is the mother of all sins, we can similarly say in the same breath that the remembrance of the Day of Judgment is the mother of all repentance. So let me show you some of the similarities and you will see why this link was made. First line of similarity is the beginning of both, Hajj and the Day of Judgment. They have similar beginnings. Hajj began with a call which Prophet Ibrahim was instructed to make after he raised the foundations of the Kaaba. So Allah Almighty said to him when he had finished, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ and proclaim to the people the Hajj. So Ibrahim ascended a nearby mount called Mount Abu Qubais and he called out to humanity saying, O people, in the middle of the desert, O people, Allah has commanded you to perform Hajj, so do so. And Allah miraculously conveyed the call of Ibrahim to all of mankind and you and I 1400 years are more than that of course thousands of years later we are responding to that call Hajj began with a call what about Yawm Al-Qiyamah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and the trumpet will be blown Allah said the second blowing of the horn 
and behold, from their graves they will be coming out quickly to their Lord. Hajj began with a call. Yom al Qiyamah, day of judgment, will begin with a call. A second line of comparison between the two are the farewells of both. Days before the pilgrim departs for Hajj, he bids his family farewell, she texts her friends, he begs for their forgiveness, they repay their debts, they write a will. SubhanAllah, it really as if it really is as if the pilgrim is making his way to the home of the hereafter. A third line of comparison is the nudity of both Hajj and the Day of Judgment. The male pilgrim undresses. Two pieces of fabric will be their attire for two or three days. And here you cannot help but realize the striking resemblance between them and the shrouds that shall cover our bodies when we will be finally lowered into our graves. Therefore, the partial nudity of the day of Hajj is a reminder of the day of absolute nudity, and that will be on the day of judgment. And that is why the Messenger وسلم, said, يُحْشَرُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حُفَاتًا عُرَاتًا غُرْلًا People will be resurrected on the day of judgment, barefooted, unclothed, and uncircumcised. The way Allah created you. Our mother Aisha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, الرجال والنساء ينظر بعضهم إلى بعض. Messenger of Allah, the men and women, will they not be looking at each other? How did he respond to her? He responded by saying, Ya Aisha, do al-amr ashad min an yuhimahu dhalik. O Aisha, the matter on the day of judgment will be so severe for anyone to care about looking at their neighbor. So this is the third line of comparison, the, the nudity of both, the day of judgment and hajj, subhanallah. The fourth line of comparison between the two, the aura of both, the crowds of hajj, the cramming involved in each one of the phases of hajj, the perpetual calling and yelling and loud sounds, it's a reminder of why Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment, was given the names of Yawm Al-Hashr, the day of cramming, and Yawm Al-Tanad, the, the day of calling, and Yawm Al-Talaq, the day of meeting. On that note, why was it called the day of meeting? Ibn Abbas, he said, it's called the day of meeting because it's the day in which Adam, the first of mankind, will meet the last of his children, the day of judgment, subhanAllah. Qatada, he said that it is called Yawm Al-Talaq, the day of meeting, because it's the day in which the inhabitants of the earth will finally meet the inhabitants of the sky. And the creation will finally meet the Creator, the day of meeting. Maymun ibn Mahran, he said it's called the day of meeting because it's the day in which the oppressed will finally meet his oppressor. Others have said that it is the day of meeting because it is the day in which a person shall meet the fruits of all of what he did today. And undoubtedly, all of this shall come to pass. So this is another, this is another line of comparison between the between the two. The, the aura of both, the feel of the ambience of both. And on top of the cramming, by the way, the pilgrims are also driven together, all together towards the same direction. And what is that a reminder of? That is a reminder of the day of judgment. Well, where it shall be announced, Ya Ayuhannas, Halumu ila Rabbikum. O oh, mankind, make your way to your Lord. The day of judgment. O oh, mankind, make your way to your Lord. Same direction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said about this, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ الدَّاعِيَةِ لَا عِوَجَ لَهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ الدَّاعِيَةِ لَا عِوَجَ لَهُ That is the day where people will follow the call of the caller without any deviation. That's another line of comparison. Another line of comparison, the sweating of both, the perspiration of both. I mean, Hajj really amazes me at how much your body has the ability to sweat without shriveling up like a prune. SubhanAllah. A reminder of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, يَعْرَقُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ حَتَّى يَذْهَبَ عَرَقُوهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ سَبْعِينَ ذِرَاعًا وَيُلْجِمُهُمْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ أَهْدَانَهُمْ People will sweat on the day of judgment till their perspiration enters into the soil a distance of 70 
arm's length, and the sweat of others will rise till it submerges them, reaching their ears. That's another line of comparison. Another line of comparison is the sleep and the awakening of both. Look at the night of Muzdalifah during your Hajj. You recline on the ground to sleep on the soil with the stars above you, wearing just two basic garments, oh brother that is, barely covering you. And here, you can't help but envisage your eventual lowering into the soil, which shall be your home till the day of judgment. Do you see the comparison? Back to Muzdalifa in Hajj. Your tour operator wakes you up to pray your dawn prayer. You rise in a disheveled state, rough and dusty. That's so similar to your eventual emergence from your grave on the day of reckoning. Again, you will be rough and disheveled. Okay, back to Hajj. You, you finish your, your Fajr prayer in Muzdalifa. You uh, glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just before sunrise, just as people will be glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of reckoning in preparation for the judgment. The resemblance is striking. Then back to Hajj, you and your group, you, you leave Muzdalifa along with the millions of others moving in the same direction just as you shall be made to move on the day of reckoning towards Allah in the same direction for 50,000 years. La ilaha illallah. Another line of comparison between the both or similarity between both is the transitions involved in both Hajj and the Day of Judgment. The movement. Hajj, few days. But the amount of transition from place to place is amazing. I mean, you start off in Mina for a night. Then from Mina you go to Arafah, then from Arafah you go to Muzdalifah. Then Muzdalifah is the stoning of the Jamarat. Then you have the offering of the sacrifice, then it's the shaving of the hair. And then it's Mecca again for circumambulation. Then it's back to Mina for three days. Then you go back to the Jamarat for the stoning once on each of those three days. Then you go back to Mecca to do your farewell circumambulation. Subhanallah al all of this movement and transitioning is in striking resemblance to the movement that will happen on the Day of Judgment and the restlessness that people will be in. Look at the phases. First it's death, then it's the grave, then it's the resurrection, then it's the gathering, then it's the intercession, then it's the judgment, then it's the receiving of books, then it's the scales, then it's as sirat the bridge, then it is paradise or hell. Are you beginning to see the resemblance between the two? Another line of resemblance is the outcomes of both Hajj and the Day of Judgment. The excitement, Allahu Akbar, of the pilgrim when he comes back is unexplainable. What awaits them now is a life of purity and forgiveness and hope and family and friends congratulate them, which, which adds to your feeling of achievement and success. People are saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Similarly, when the horrors of the Day of Judgment come to an end and the believers finally set foot in Jannah and they rest in their palaces and they meet their family, all what will be heard there in Jannah is what? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَتَرَى الْمَلَائِكَةَ حَافِّينَ مِنْ حَوْلِ الْعَرْشِ And you will see the angels surrounding the throne of Allah. يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ As they glorify the praises of their Lord. وَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ And it will be judged between them in truth. Listen to this ending of the ayah. وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And it will be said, all praise is to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So, this is really one of the most important secrets that makes Hajj this life and afterlife changing experience. And a pillar of the religion, despite it being only three or so days, maybe in your lifetime, because we said it is a stark reminder of the Day of Judgment. That is lesson number one. Lesson number two, why Hajj is of this significance deserving the title of pillar of the religion. It's one of the most profitable ways of collecting good deeds within a short period of time. 
I remember one pilgrim two years ago who said in Hajj, he said, you know, Ali, the more I read into the narrations that detail out the reward involved with the different phases of Hajj, the more I realize how this opportunity of Hajj is like a person who goes into a shopping supermarket with a trolley and he's allowed to fill his trolley as much as he wishes for free. He said, this is Hajj, just collecting good deeds from all over the place. It's true because as a pilgrim, you are a guest of who? You are a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will never come across a host who is more generous than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, two men came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asking him about the rewards associated with each of the phases of Hajj. And he gave a beautiful response. So beautiful, I want to translate it sentence by sentence. He said to them, إِنَّكَ إِذَا خَرَجْتَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ تَأُمْ الْبَيْتَ الْحَرَامِ لَا تَضَعُوا نَاقَتُكَ خُفًّا وَلَا تَرْفَعُهُ إِلَّا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكَ بِهَا حَسَنًا وَمَحَا عَنْكَ بِهَا خَطِيَةً He said, when you leave your home, aiming for the Kaaba, every time your camel raises its foot or lowers it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for you a good deed and will erase from you a sin. Imagine every step of the way from the moment you leave your home in the UK, America, or wherever you may be. He said, And as for the two units of salah, which you pray after circumambulation, that is the same reward as freeing a slave. And as for your staying at Arafah, this is the grand finale of Hajj, as for your staying at Arafah, till the evening or in the evening, Allah descends to the lower heaven and He begins to boast about you to the angels. What does Allah say to the angels? He says, These are my servants. These are my servants who have come to me in a rough state from every deep valley of the world, hoping for nothing other than my paradise. Then Allah says the amazing, Allah says then to the angels, therefore, if their sins were equivalent to the grains of the sand, or the drops of the rain, or like the foam of the sea, I will forgive them. So proceed, O oh my servants, you have been forgiven, and all of those whom you intercede for. And then he says, and as for your stoning of the jimar, those stone pillars that you pelt the stones at, then for every stone that you throw, it will erase one of your major sins. And as for your slaughtering of the animal, the reward of this will be saved with your Lord. And then he says, وَأَمَّا حِلَاقُكَ رَأْسَكَ فَلَكَ بِكُلِّ شَعْرَةٍ حَلَقْتَهَا حَسَنًا وَيُمْحَا عَنْكَ بِهَا خَطِيئًا And as for your shaving of your head, then for every strand of hair that falls off your head, a good deed will be written for you and your, a sin of yours will be erased. Are you imagining here, dear brothers and sisters, what is involved in terms of the good deeds and this, the opportunity for forgiveness here? The hadith continues though. وَأَمَّا طَوَافُكَ بِالْبَيْتِ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَإِنَّكَ تَطُوفُ وَلَا ذَنْبَ لَكَ And then when you do your circumambulation around the Kaaba after this, then by this time you are doing so without a sin to your name. Then an angel, he said, comes to you and places his hand between your shoulders, saying to you, اعمل فيما تستقبل فقد غفر الله لك ما مضى Work hard in doing good deeds in the days to come because your sins of the past have all been forgiven. So this is the second of the secrets of Hajj that I wanted to share with you. It is such an unprecedented opportunity to collect good deeds in a way like no other avenue can provide. The last of the three reasons I wanted to share with you that qualifies Hajj to be given this title of pillar despite being only three days Number three, it is one of the greatest templates of success 
for human beings. From a management perspective, what is it that makes a person successful? This is undoubtedly one of the most highly discussed questions in life and everyone has a theory to put forward. And perhaps a summary of much of what has been discussed by Muslims and non-Muslims alike can be listed under three main headings. The first thing they say that brings about success is clarity of vision. So successful people, they start with the end in mind. They know exactly what they want to achieve. The second of those things is something called dedication. Yeah, as Muslims, we may reword that to sabr, patience. A third thing they mention is the element of networking. As Muslims, we may reword that to what? Unity. Amazingly, our religion has given paramount importance to every one of those three qualities. I mean, let me show you. The first of them, we said clarity of vision. What did the Prophet ﷺ mean when he said, Actions are by intentions. Yeah, and some scholars have said that this narration is half of the religion. Your intention sets your goal. Our goal is Allah. Our vision is very clear. That is number one, clarity of vision. This is our niyyah. Allah is our niyyah. Number two, we said the greatest component for success is dedication. We said patience, sabr. And this has appeared in the Quran in no less than 90, 90 places. And this has appeared in the Quran in no less than 90 places. As Imam Ahmad, he said, the element of networking or unity, unity. Never once did Allah address us in the Quran as individuals, individual Muslims. Ya ayyuhal mu'min. He said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu aw you who have believed collectively. Now what is even more amazing is that all three of these qualities are clearly manifest and present in Hajj. Think about it, Hajj, Hajj. What does it mean linguistically? Al-Qasd. It means aim. So the pilgrim, he knows where he is going, what he's going to do, what he wants in the end. This is the element of what? The clarity of vision. Or we said, the sincerity. Hajj is an aim. Number two, Hajj is also an immense exercise in patience. You're, you're challenged in every way. You're, you're adapting to uh, situations that you thought you could never adapt to. That's number two, we said dedication, patience. Number three, Hajj is a miraculous manifestation of global Muslim unity. And of course, we don't need to elaborate upon that. Therefore, Hajj, subhanAllah, is a model of success. And should you wish to be a successful person, write down those three qualities that we just spoke about somewhere where you can see them frequently. Then, after that, make every effort to extend those three Hajj based qualities into your everyday life and plug them in till you die. So, for example, don't live without a vision. Then after that, be committed to that vision till the day you die looking to achieve it. And number three, don't operate by yourself. Network. The more you network, the more successful you will be. Hajj, dear brothers and sisters, teaches you and I to be the conscious of the country of residence of ours by being a model of success. Hajj is an inspiring and empowering experience because there in Hajj, you realize that Muslims are not an insignificant minority. They're an incredibly mighty body that is nearing its awakening. And when it does finally awake and finds its voice, the world will marvel at the model of success that it shall set for humanity. But till that day arrives, allow Hajj to inspire you to play a role in this by setting a vision for yourself, then dedicating yourself to it. And then number three, doing all what you can to be in the midst of the people of goodness. Throw yourself in their midst. Don't deprive yourself from the potential which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside of you. And we have just discovered that Hajj is a key way of releasing that potential. Uh -huh.